Into every generation, a slayer is born. But does wielding the strength and skill to fight vampires, demons, and the forces of darkness automatically make her a good person? What about her friends and enemies? With soul, magic, and manipulation, morality can be a lot of work. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and today we'll be ranking Buffy the Vampire Slayer characters from good to evil. All right, the rules. For this video, we'll be ranking characters into three categories, the good, the gray, and the bad to evil. There will be a lot to take into consideration, their good qualities, their bad qualities, and how much they grow and overcome over the course of the show. And notice how we said, the show? We will not be looking at any spinoffs. Sorry, Angel fans. The season 8 comic, or even the movie that spawned the show, we'll just be looking at the series. Obviously, we won't be hitting all the characters from the seven season run, but we've done our best to get a variety of the most featured as well as the most iconic characters. And obviously, there's a huge spoiler warning, so consider this your last chance to catch up. All right, let's get ready to slay this list. First, we have the good. These are the characters who are pure, who put in the most effort to become pure, or have proven their dedication to world saving most often. Taking the gold medal of good is Tara McClay. While there were characters with a bigger role and more screen time, we don't think there were any with Tara's capacity for good. Though her family believed that she was part demon, she went off on her own anyway and learned how to use Wiccan magic for good. She fell in love with Willow and was a steady source of good in Willow's life. She's the most concerned and the most helpful when she notices that Willow is starting to abuse magic and does her best to help her lover become more grounded and focused on the good. Though her run in the series was tragically short, she had a strong impact and was an undeniable light in a dark time. Taking the silver medal of good is our titular Buffy Summers. Buffy is a perfect depiction of what it means for a human being with flaws, desires, and struggles to consistently be good. She makes difficult decisions and constant sacrifices to put her family, friends, and the fate of the world above her own wants. This doesn't mean that she never slips up because she does. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have a selfish nature because sometimes she does. She's human. She's all of us. I mean, look at season one. She wants to have time with her friends, try out cheerleading, run for homecoming queen, and have the experiences of a normal teenage girl. She can't let go of the life she could have had before she became chosen, and it's obvious how much that hurts her. Even in the season 1 finale, we see that she's willing to give it all up, including her life to save the world. The struggles become more and more serious. She eventually has to deal with the very human struggles of providing for her family and working at a soul-sucking job to keep the house running and try to pay the bills. We see her suffer the mental effects of years of fighting evil. She has to give up college and a good career, and basically everything to continue saving the world. Often, she's not appreciated for all these sacrifices. She slips up, she snaps, sometimes she makes really poor impulsive decisions and expects too much of those around her. These are all forgivable traits of someone from whom the world has taken too much. The fact that she still tries to continue saving the world shows the real strength of her character. With all she goes through, it's amazing she wants to attempt to be good, let alone succeed over and over when it comes to the consistent trials she must endure. And the exact opposite of that, the bronze medal of good goes to Spike, aka William the Bloody. Yeah, we could probably do an entire video analyzing the details that went into making this decision. We know there are a lot of people that are not going to agree, but we hope you'll listen to our argument. While Buffy constantly chooses right over wrong, Spike is someone who shows his good nature with a few outstanding moments instead. It's not as difficult, but considering where he came from and what he's had to overcome, we think it's worthy of praise. Spike was a good person when he was human. We think that's a good baseline for what his real personality was. He was sweet and well-meaning, and he struggled. He was the underdog. Then he was turned into a vampire. His soul was lost. In the Buffy lore, all vampires are soulless, cruel demons who want nothing more than to play games with people, cause suffering, and drink blood. This is a side of Spike that we definitely see. In fact, that's how he's introduced. Unlike Angel, however, Spike's redemption arc is not initiated because his soul is returned. Spike, as a demon, learns how to be a better person for his unrequited love of Buffy. That's unprecedented in the show's lore. It also means, unfortunately, that he slips up. And when Spike messes up, he really, really messes up. There's actually an episode where he attempts to assault Buffy, something for which he feels terribly, and actually starts his redemption arc. 
We're not saying that's okay, we're not saying we condone it, we're not even saying that we forgive him, but that is what vampires in this world are like, and we have to give Spike credit for fighting his nature. We also have to give him credit, of course, for sacrificing himself to save the world in the finale. While impulsive, one-time, large sacrifices are not the steady signs of a good person, it was enough, in combination with his previous efforts, to make him worthy of the slot. Next is Kendra. Kendra can be abrasive. She trained as a slayer in a much more official and dedicated capacity than Buffy did, and it leads them to butting heads when she's first introduced. That being said, she has studied the responsibility and approaches it with a level of dedication that is truly admirable for a girl her age. Though this puts her in sharp contrast with Buffy during her second season arc on the show, these are a lot of the qualities that Buffy herself ends up having by the end of the series that makes her so strong. So maybe Kendra had a larger impact in those few episodes than we would have known. Next is Oz. A lot of the things we said about Spike would apply to Oz, who was also a very sweet person before becoming afflicted. Though for Oz, his struggle is as a werewolf, not vampire. It's a different beast, if you'll pardon the expression. He stumbles, and there are situations that he handles less than perfectly. All things considered, we feel like he did an excellent job. Though the arcs were similar, and we think Oz's crimes were less severe, that also means he didn't have as much to learn or sacrifice. He overcomes a lot, but ultimately starts and ends the series in a fairly similar state of mind. Now we have Jenny Callender. Despite having a short-lived arc early into the series, we think that Jenny was a good influence overall. She kept secrets, yes, but she worked with the Scoobies to help save the world. She used her traditional Romani magic, computer-savvy, and optimistic personality to bring light to the demon-hunting teens. She was one of the first recurring characters to die, and it taught us that the show meant business. Up next is Willow Rosenberg. We know, we know, you've all been waiting for Willow. There are ups and downs to having so much screen time, and one of the downsides is the extra time to do bad things. In the early seasons, Willow is sweet, sheltered, girl who can do virtually nothing wrong. Seeing her expand her horizons, take risks, and step out of her comfort zone was one of the biggest signs of growth in the series. Unfortunately, she makes a lot of mistakes. It's part of growing, and yeah, she learned from it, but her addiction and misuse of magic almost turns her into a world-ending villain, so we hope that you'll understand our hesitation to rank her higher than we did. Whereas many characters have struggles with the supernatural, Willow's struggle comes from within. It's also worth mentioning that she also doesn't have a perfect track record with relationships. Early into the series, she cheats on Oz, and later on, we see all the gaslighting she does to Tara. She manipulates Tara into forgetting that they were fighting about her overuse of magic by, well, using magic. That's pretty on the nose. While we think she learns a lot and ends the series in a good place as a more mature and well-rounded woman, we were a little surprised to tally up her crimes over the course of seven seasons. Next is her best friend, Xander Harris. Xander, much like Willow, starts the series as a very pure person and finds difficulty staying on the good path. Their arcs are even interconnected, since he's the one that reminds her she's a good person and keeps her from ending the world. There are two things that we think place him a little lower than her. One is his attitude. Many of Xander's struggles also come from within, but instead of fighting addiction to power, Xander struggles on and off with his insecurities. He's not the chosen one, he has trouble keeping up on the constant research, and he doesn't have any kind of magical powers that help him with the fighting. Personally, we feel that makes his contributions and undying dedication to the gang more impressive. By the end, once he's stopped letting his college insecurity drag him down and has found the good job that lets him provide reinforcements to the summer's home, we see him as an absolute hero. What doesn't help is that he's constantly putting himself in danger and letting that emotional baggage drop on the others at the worst time. He's not entirely clean when it comes to partners either. He was also in a relationship when he and Willow got together, not to mention leaving Anya at the altar. While we may understand why he did it, we're not sure we can ever entirely forgive him. Seriously that episode was rough. Rounding out the tier is Cordelia Chase. Cordelia has plenty of skeletons in her closet during her three-season run on Buffy. Aside from being the typical bully for much of the series, her biggest sin is just not seeming to be as invested in the others and keeping the world safe. So why put her in the good tier? Well, because she learns to care, silly. It's a lot of character growth, as we learn to see how she's overcoming her superficial nature for things that are more serious, a big achievement for a high schooler. Buffy also had a similar arc, but unlike the Slayer, Cordelia has no divine intervention making 
taking her care. She just learns to see the bigger picture, and we wanted to applaud her for that. Now we move into the gray. These are some of the deepest, most complex characters in the series. While we may understand the effects of their deeds, we may never entirely know what compels them to act as they do, for the greater good or otherwise. Kicking off the tier is Rupert Giles. There is a lot to unpack about Giles as a character. At different points, he's the embodiment of rules and tradition, and at another point, we're supposed to see him as a rebel and the dawn of a new age in Slayer training. He's got warlock training, he's a rocker. While we admire many of his decisions, like that of backing Buffy against the Council of Watchers, we have to wonder about his involvement as a Watcher in the first place. Though we're sure it came from a good place, we watch him constantly ask more and more of Buffy. Even though he takes the role of a father figure from the time she's 16 years old, there are countless points where he expects her to make major sacrifices or tries to protect her in a way that proves less than helpful. And once more with feeling, we hear that he expresses a wish to step in and help her, but this seems just like another build-up to him not actually getting her the assistance that she so desperately needs. One of his lowest points was when he sides against Buffy and ends up kicking her out of her own house. While he was not alone in that decision, we feel like it was especially harsh of him to take that side. He knew better than anyone what she'd sacrifice to keep that house a safe place for the potential slayers that were training. Plus, again, he was seen at the time as her father figure. Not supporting her or defusing the situation hurt more than seeing her fight with her friends and peers. The fact that he's had all these experiences with Buffy and still doesn't trust her entirely makes us question how he viewed their relationship and what he had learned from it. Next is Anya. Anya, formerly the demon Ankyaka, has a redemption arc like many of those in our good tier. Don't get us wrong, we think she makes tremendous growth with human morals. She even dies fighting in the big battle, a sacrifice that no one was expecting. Unfortunately, there were some bad habits she couldn't quite shake from her demon days. She's greedy, self-involved, and while she can put that stuff aside when it really matters, we think she can manage to do a bit of passive damage on the day-to-day, -day, even toward the end of the series. Anya had to be pushed more into her redemption arc than some of the others. Sure, Spike had a morality chip in his head that initially put him on the right path, but Anya was literally kicked out of her demonhood before she came around to the good side. Even then, she had a hard time accepting it, and eventually just seemed to be making the best of her situation. Next is Andrew Wells. Andrew is, and we say this with love, a pushover. Though he became a watcher for the potential slayers towards the end, he was actually introduced as a sort of supervillain when he was a part of the trio. After watching his participation on the sides of both good and evil, one thing we notice is how easily influenced he is. Sometimes that can be a good thing, but sometimes, well, he was part of the trio. Next is Mrs. Summers. She was a loved character, and sometimes that's actually a lot more important of a presence than being good or bad. We admit that Mrs. Summers made mistakes as often, if not more, than she actually helped. But she was raising a teenage daughter alone, and then had to deal with Buffy's behavioral issues stemmed from her being a chosen one. It's a lot for one person to deal with, and for the first couple of seasons, she didn't know what she was dealing with. There are times, especially after that, where she doesn't handle the information well. What highlights the good and bad side of Mrs. Summers was when Buffy ran away from home. Joyce tells her not to bother coming back if she leaves, but she doesn't give up looking for her and makes sure she knows she has a safe place to return to. The deeds may weigh her down, but her good intentions are worth mentioning. Next is Buffy's sister, Dawn Summers. It was a shock when Dawn came onto the show. It was always a shock when, seemingly, overnight, the only child has a teenage sister. Dawn may be a personified embodiment of energy that was supposed to be the key to another dimension, but she somehow still takes after her mother. We believe that she means well. We're tempted to give her a pass because of her age, but the truth is that Dawn is immature. Growing up with a sister who is a slayer can't be easy, but Dawn struggles to grow up at all. She's constantly throwing tantrums, getting in the way, and often making more work for the people who are trying to save the world. She has some moments of depth, and every now and then she supports Buffy the way that families should support each other in tough times. Unfortunately, those moments are few and far between, especially in the first season that we see her. Next is Angel. To say that Angel is a fan favorite would probably be an understatement. This character was so big that he got his own show. We would like to remind you that his actions on Angel do not count for or against him, just his work on Buffy. Angel is the first and for a while only vampire gone good. That is something that is really forced upon him, however, and a lot of his redemption arc and growth unfortunately happened on the spinoff. 
not on Buffy. While fans were devastated to see his soul return right before he needed to be killed, many felt like there wasn't a satisfying resolution to their relationship after his return. We're looking even before that, to the breaking of his curse and the actions leading up to it. There was a lot of pain and grief caused after his one moment of pure happiness with Buffy broke the curse, giving him his soul and turned him into a monster. If he hadn't poured so much time and energy into his image of being brooding and mysterious, this was an issue that could have been entirely resolved by better communication in their relationship. Angelus also is a piece of work. When he's a soulless vampire, there is a definite emphasis on soullessness. We can't hold that against him entirely, that is the nature of vampires, but it's in a very stark contrast to Spike eventually learning to do better and be better, even without his soul. You may personally think he redeems himself over his own show, we may actually agree with you, but on Buffy, we just think there were many ways in which he could have and should have done better from the beginning. He was an older, much older man, and he could have done a lot to spare someone he loved from a lot of pain had he acted even a fraction of his age. Next is another one of Buffy's ill-fated exes, Riley Fenn. For a character that didn't get a lot of screen time, there was a lot going on with him. The military brainwashing of the initiative, the super soldier drugs, his withdrawal, his insecurities. Riley was a character who was sort of set up to fail by the people around him. While we don't entirely blame him for all the alpha masculine beliefs he was subjected to, it's also hard to forgive his behaviors. It's obvious that once the initiative collapses, Riley is insecure, and for a good period, he takes that out on Buffy. Then he blames her for not being trusting and honest with him when he needs it, even though he very likely contributed to her trust issues in that relationship. One of the times we see his personality without a ton of external influence is when he shows up nearly a year after leaving to ask for Buffy's help. He shows up married to a woman more in his league, and they need Buffy to step in with one of their demon hunting projects. Riley expects Buffy to be okay with this and gives her very little heads up about his wife Samantha, whom he also expects her to be okay working with. This feels like a double standard when we see how poorly he reacts to finding out that Buffy is in a relationship with Spike. Rounding out the tier is Faith Lahane. Faith is a great character. Despite seldom being the focus, she's someone that you empathize with, even when she's infuriating. She's been in the good and bad tiers at different points in her life, and honestly, a case could have been made for putting her just about anywhere. Her poor upbringing garners sympathy for even her early faux pas before we really know her, when she's still being a bad influence. She has an actual villain arc in the third season when she decides to team up with the big baddie. There are many instances when it seems to be Buffy versus Faith. This puts more strain during the final season. When Buffy's eventually booted out of leading the potential slayers, Faith steps up and does what must be done. While this seems like Faith benefiting from Buffy's failure, even once she's joined the good side, we can see how uncomfortable she is stepping in, presumably for that very reason. At this point in her life, she's trying to do better, and sometimes the right thing doesn't always feel as good as she would like. For that reason, and her helping save the world, we have put her in the grades here, but all the same, she was an impressive villain. Finally, we have the bad to evil. These are the most influential villains. Though we had to exclude some of our favorites due to limited screen time, we feel confident that you'll be shaken by the morals of the following entries. Kicking things off is Warren Mears. We can't really say that Warren Mears ever meant well, but mostly he was harmless. Mostly. He had supervillain intentions when he started the trio, but the group was up to more hijinks than actual villainy. It says a lot that the one death he's guilty of was the murder of the wrong person. He was responsible for shooting Tara in an ill-fated attempt to finally take out Buffy. And as we all know, he suffered for that mistake. While he was a bad guy, his ineptitude really saved him from being lower on the tier. Next is Principal Snyder. Principal Snyder was, eventually, proven wrong in the end and in such a spectacular fashion. Learning a lesson, however, is not the same as being redeemed. Snyder lets the power of being the high school principal go to his little head so quickly. Whereas a lot of administrative workers are just doing their job and that sort of paints him as an antagonist, Principal Snyder relished in making things as difficult as he could for the Scoobies and all the other students, right up till the end. Next is the Master. It's almost unfair to put the Master on this list because we never do see him at full power. What we do see, however, is his influence. We don't think he'd have such a following if he hadn't been fearsome in his time. It's worth mentioning that he's also one of the only two people to ever successfully kill Buffy, the other being Buffy herself. Still, with each season raising the stakes of the big bad evil, you can hardly blame us for putting the first season antagonist this low on the list. Next is Drusilla. 
She has a personality, aesthetic, and everything you'd want for a gothic vampire queen. We understand why the men are tripping over themselves to help strengthen her. Spike and Angel have both, at different times, found themselves in her company and under her spell. For that reason, it's easy to see Drusilla as a symbolic draw of the dark side. Though we never see her at full power either, because of the madness that she's succumbed to over the centuries, we do know that she's a dangerous influence. Spike's love for Buffy eventually leads him to destroy her hold on him, but it's a close thing toward the end. And anyone capable of making the show's most evil creatures want to be more evil? That's definitely someone dangerous that we don't want to be messing with. Following her is Adam. We could have put Maggie Walsh here, and believe us, we thought about it. There was a lot about her time running the initiative that was shady. We've already seen what sort of effect her training had on Riley, and believed that she was smart enough to know what she was doing, and she was a psychology professor. Unfortunately, she was also smart enough to create Adam, the big evil of season 4, who ultimately killed her. He had her skewed notion of the world, without any of her human experience, empathy, or ethical quandaries. Plus, you know, the super strength. As a thought experiment, Adam is fascinating. As an actual creation set loose on the world, yeah, yeah, that, he was pretty much just built for extermination, wasn't he? Falling just short of the medals is the mayor. The mayor was scary because he was friendly. He had that sweet politician smile and enough charm to put anyone suspicious of him at ease. Who would have ever thought that he was going to turn into a literal monster? Well, there were plenty of hints, but that's sort of the scary part, isn't it? Even though he was, not so subtly, a giant snake who was planning a massive takeover and to massacre Buffy and the other students at graduation, he was still able to keep gaining power. Some of his alliances were with other evils, yeah, but look at how he was able to manipulate Faith into working against her own interest. Without getting too political, the mayor was a perfect stand-in for some of the most human evils, while not even having to be human himself. Taking the bronze medal of evil is Caleb. We're not sure about you, but Buffy made us so afraid of Nathan Fillion that we almost couldn't enjoy Firefly. Caleb was the vicious priest-turned-serial killer with a gospel that praises and worships the very idea of evil itself. He organized an attack to kill not just people who were fighting the forces of evil, but also potential slayers who would be able to pick up the fight for good later down the road. Even before getting sucked in by actual literal evil, he was confirmed to be responsible for the deaths of at least two women whom he seduced. Then, using his deep-rooted misogyny and the excuse of a higher calling, he preaches about the Whore of Babylon before continuing to take up this dark crusade. Also, do you remember the look of satisfaction when he took out Xander's eye? Absolutely terrifying. Taking the silver medal of evil is Glory, aka Glorificus. On the one hand, we almost want to give Glory a pass. She's a literal deity from a hell dimension, where it probably makes a lot of sense that someone has to fill the role of sadist. Godly morals are different than our own mortal code of ethics. On the other hand, well, pretty much the same argument. She's trapped in a human body for the fifth season of Buffy, but has the personality and many of the powers of a hell goddess who wants to inflict pain and suffering. One of the most disturbing elements of Glory was how she fed off the mental energy of mortals to keep herself from going insane while trapped in our world. After Tara's traumatic experience with being fed off in this way, we understand better just how terrible the experience of her being free in our world was. Unsurprisingly, Glory was willing to stop at nothing to open up the portal to her dimension. She got dangerously close to bringing hell on Earth, much closer than many of the others got to their less ambitious nefarious schemes. But there was still one that upstaged her. Our gold medal of evil goes to the first evil. How could it not, right? The first evil is all evil personified. Every villain in this tier was influenced and fed into that source of pure darkness. All the bad deeds from the gray section tied into the first, in spirit if nothing else. Even many of the characters in our good tier had direct confrontations with the first when he began to slip through and manipulate people in human forms. He tries to separate Buffy from her friends to weaken her, he tries to lead Spike back to the darkness and undo his progress, he drives Dawn away by impersonating Mrs. Summers. There was a reason that Caleb made it so high on our list, and that reason was his direct line of worship to this exact evil. While the first influence is often more subtle, disguised as a form of self-interest, Caleb knows exactly who and what he's praying to, and that is, well, evil. Pure, literal, corrupting evil that just had to be the lowest of the low here on our rankings. And that's it, our ranking of Buffy characters from good to evil. Who do you think was the best, and who do you think was the worst? Let us know in the comments down below, as well as any other topics you'd like to see us cover. While you're down there, don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, stay wicked.